Okay, and you're back with another video. Now, I know that I said in the previous video that I was gonna connect these coils up to a Tesla coil circuit and see it sparking and everything. Well, I've been hammered with comments on how to do a gate drive transformer, so that's what we're going to do in this video instead. Then I promise in the next video we'll get on with the coils. It wasn't a nasty comment or anything like that, it was just someone who's curious and wants to know. But speaking of nasty comments, there is someone who keeps commenting and I'm pretty sure I know who it is and uh, I'm pretty sure you're watching this video, you know who you are. Who keeps saying, oh you shouldn't mess around with electronics, transformers are dangerous, don't listen to this guy, he's gonna get you all killed. I've just got two things to say to you. One. Grow some balls, and two, shut the hell up. And now back to this. So the first thing I want to talk about is what kind of core you want to use. As you can see here, there are six cores. Well, there would be if this one wasn't here. There you go. Now you could rip these out of old circuit boards and junked electronics and stuff like that, or you could buy them. This blue one here is one that I bought. It's a little big for a gate drive transformer core, but I have something else I'm going to use these in. And the rest of these are ones that I've ripped out of old electronics. So you may be wondering, why should I buy the cores when I can just do this? Well, it's like a lucky dip. You never know what you're getting. You might get really lucky and find a core that works really well. Alternatively, you might find something that totally sucks as a gate drive transformer core. And I'm not going to lie. I've made this mistake in the past. I tried making a gate drive transformer using a core that I sourced from Scrapped Electronics. The core, of course, was made of the wrong stuff, but I didn't know that at the time, and I wondered why it didn't work. So when it comes to buying cores for gate drive transformers, I suggest buying cores made out of N30 grade material, an outer diameter of about 3 centimeters. Sorry for American viewers, I don't know what that is in inches. And of course using single strand telephone wire to make the windings. So one big factor determining how well these cores are going to work is it's all about inductance. I've taken some twisted wire and wound it around each of these ten times. So each of these cores has an input winding and an output winding, each of which is ten turns. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure the inductance of these and see how well each of these performs. My prediction is most of these are going to perform adequately, some of them are going to perform really well and some of them are going to perform really badly. You want to know what ones I think are going to perform really badly? This one and this one. So we'll start off with Big Black here, measuring in at 236.5 microhenry, and this grey one, despite being half the size, is only measuring a little bit lower at 206.3 microhenry, and this shows that size isn't everything. Double the size doesn't mean double the inductance. This green one I know is going to be the worst performer, clocking in at a measly 15.6 microhenry. Again, proving the size isn't everything, this tiny one measures more at 216 microhenry. And this one, which is only a little bit bigger, packs a walloping 887 microhenries. Okay, calm down, cool dude Clem. You're getting too excited. And lastly, this one that I nicknamed Big Blue. And although it's the biggest one here, it's a little behind the last core I measured at 713 microhenry. It's still good though, and I know someone's going to ask me this, so um, if I connect both the windings together in parallel and then measure the inductance, is that going to change it at all? Well, no it doesn't. So this is the circuit that I'm going to test the cores with. It's the same circuit that you saw in the previous video, just with a few changes. Instead of two transistors here, there is now an MIC4452 gate driver chip. A chonking great 1 microfarad capacitor across the supply pins, and that's also where I'm supplying the power, so this chip is going to get the cleanest possible supply. 
and there's another chonking great one microfarad non-polar capacitor in series with the output because as this chip is going to output pulse DC and that's bad for inductive things such as transformers and that would also pull a lot of current and burn out the chip this capacitor turns the pulsed DC into AC the current drawn will be almost nothing and everything will stay cool and this is the schematic diagram of the circuit it's like the circuit from the previous video in fact it is the circuit from the previous video just with a couple of minor alterations this resistor is gone and the two transistors are replaced by a gate driver chip there's the two chonking big capacitors and the gate drive transformer and the scope measuring the output of the transformer well enough waffle let's see if this works okay so here we are about to test the first core now this measured about 240 microhenries with 10 turns of wire around it so it might actually work I didn't think it would but um Let's see, let's plug that into the output of our circuit here. Let's see what kind of waveform we get. Oh wow, would you look at that! A perfect square wave! I really did not expect that to work. Okay, I'm gonna go up and down in frequency. We're at about 542 kilohertz. Let's go up in frequency. And that's still looking good. All right, let's go down in frequency. Down as far as this will go. So we're at about 142 kilohertz. Goes up to about 864 kilohertz. And now we're down at 142 kilohertz. And yeah, that's looking really good. So actually, I might use that as my gate drive transformer core. Okay, so here we are with the second smallest one. It looks like it's chipped there, but that's just a bit of glue that's uh, it's perfectly fine. If I remember, this one measured about 860 microhenry, I think it was. But let's see how well this performs. We're getting a nice clean square wave out of it, so that's good. Up in frequency. That looks really good too. Okay, let's go down as far as it can go. It's also looking really good. I just want to point out that you could use a couple of transistors instead of a gate driver chip, but um, in my experiments, that's always um, resulted in a subpar waveform, so uh, using a gate driver chip is uh, my choice. Okay, now we're trying this tiny one. I forget how many microhenries this measured, but it looks good. Going up to 800 and 64 kilohertz looks just as good as the other ones going down to 143 kilohertz it also looks good here's the big blue one which measured about 750 something microhenry I think again looks really good let's go up in frequency and let's see how good our square wave is Yep, that looks nice and good. Alright, I'm gonna go down to about 150 or whatever it was. 143. Yeah, that looks really, really good. Now here we are with the grey one. Now I know this was originally a transformer, but again I forgot what it came out of. And again, we're getting a very nice clean square wave out of it. Let's go up all the way in frequency. It's looking nice and good. Alright. Now let's go down as far as we can go. That is looking really, really good. <coughs> Excuse me. And now to test the one that I know is not going to work. Well, I'm only going to do this briefly because its inductance is so low it might overload the chip. So I'll just go over to the scope and I'll just connect this up briefly and we'll see what wave we get. That's well, not too bad, but... Yeah, you can see some sloping there. Let's just try it on the right frequency. 
to try it on 800 and whatever. And now we're going to try it on 140 kilohertz. Yeah, that is bad. And just for the heck of it, that old gate drive transformer that I made, this is 12 turns and has a inductance of about 81 microhenry. Let's see what kind of waveform we get. So this is at 500, almost 550 kilohertz. Let's go up to our 800 and whatever. 864 kilohertz. All right. Let's go down to about 140 kilohertz. It's working well, but I'm starting to see just a little bit of sloping there. So, uh, if I was you, I would go for something that has at least 200 microhenries of inductance. So we know twisting wires around each other and then winding them round a core works really well. But that's not the only way you can do it. So I'm going to show two other ways you could wind them round a core. One good way and one bad way. Here's the other good way you can do it, and that's by interleaving the windings. As you can see, we've got orange, white, orange, white, orange, white, going all the way around. And on the scope, we still have a perfectly good waveform. And again, we'll go up and down in frequency, so let's go down as far as we can go. It's about 142 hertz and kilohertz. Nice and clean. Eight hundred and sixty-three kilohertz. Yeah, we got a little bit of ramping from the circuit there, but you can see it still works really good. And now this is the way you definitely don't want to do it, because this is going to cause you all kinds of problems. So you can see in this case, we've got our input winding here, our output winding here, and on the scope, we've got a very nasty looking waveform. Spiky, we've got all this ringing here. Yeah, it's totally unusable. And now it's time to get crazy. So, what I've done is I've taken some four core telephone wire, wound it around the core 10 times. I'm putting the voltage into the blue wire and we're measuring what's coming out of the orange wire. Now, do you think this is going to work? It does. Well, we got a little bit of the slightest hint of ringing there, but it's still good. You could still use this. And here's a similar way. This time I've used some screened cable. I'm putting the signal into the inner conductor and we're measuring what's coming out of the outer conductor. And yeah, I mean, yeah, works about as good as, um, about as good as this one did. And before anybody asks about this weird thing in the middle, that's just a pen cap with some tape around it to hold the wires in place. And that brings us to the gate drive transformer that I'm going to use. So this is that grey core. And the way I wound this one is I just bunched four wires together and then wound them around the core 12 times. That gives us an inductance of about 375 microhenry. And yeah, I've stuck a pen cap in the middle of there to keep the wires in place because if you don't do that, well, uh, yeah, that can happen. So this is two white wires, a brown wire and a blue wire, wound around the core 12 times. But I know what you're saying, how good is the waveform? Well, there we are. There's a tiny little bit of overshoot and maybe the faintest hint of some ringing, but this is a perfectly acceptable waveform. This is what you want to try and go for. Let's test the frequency range, let's go down all the way. So it's 143 kilohertz. Looking nice and square, nice, nice square edges. All right, let's go up in frequency. 864 kilohertz. Yeah, that's looking good. Yeah, once this is connected to a MOSFET gate, um, it's gonna smooth that out anyway, so you don't really need to worry. So, like I said, we've got four windings on this core. Two white ones, a blue one and a brown one. The two white ones I've connected to the circuit in parallel. We were measuring what the blue wire was outputting. Now we're measuring what the brown wire is outputting. And yeah, it looks just as good. 
Where now? With MOSFETs. So we have the transformer, uh, the gate drive transformer, connected up to the gates of these two MOSFETs through these two variable resistors here, and I'll explain why that is in just a moment. But let's take a look at our waveform at one of the MOSFET gates. And it looks good. Let's take a look at our other MOSFET connected. And it also looks good. So you might be wondering just how I'm getting such a good waveform. Because I'm sure if you've done this in the past, you've got really horrible waveforms on the scope. So what's my secret? Well, it's all about the two resistors connecting the transformer to the MOSFET's gates. See, the thing is, you've got to remember, this is basically an inductor. This is basically a capacitor. And if you connect them directly to each other, you form a tuned circuit, and it's going to ring like a bell, as I will now demonstrate. OK, so I've got my screwdriver here, and I'm going to turn the resistance down. And we'll see what happens on the scope. You see that? That's that no resistance now, and look at that. So with little or no resistance between your transformer and your MOSFET gate, you're going to get this. And if you have too much resistance, you're going to get this. What you want is this. And that's basically it. So when you found out what the resistance of these two resistors is, you can replace those with fixed resistor of the same value. Alternatively, there is one other way you could do it. So instead of a resistor between each MOSFET and the gate drive transformer, we put a resistor between the output of the circuits and the gate drive transformer. And this will also work just as well. So as you can see, we've got a nice clean square wave. And as I adjust this, which is going into the gate drive transformer, you can see we can go between really crappy slopey waveforms, nice square wave waveforms, square wave with a little bit of overshoot, and completely ringing like a bell. So let's just back that off until we get a nice clean square wave again. So anyway, there you go. We have our circuit, our gate drive transformer, our MOSFETs, and a nice clean waveform. And yes, before anybody says anything, yes, I know that when we put a load on the MOSFETs, their capacitance is going to go up and I need to adjust this again, but let's not worry about that now. There is just one more thing I want to touch on before we go, and that's this way to connect the MOSFETs to the transformer. Now, I hope you can read my incredibly bad writing. As you can see here, we have the signal coming in from the circuit. Here's the one microfarad capacitor, here's the 50 ohm resistor, and that's it. Somewhere between 5 and 10 ohms, I'm not sure exactly, I haven't measured it. And then there's the transformer. We have the two input windings connected in parallel. With two input windings it just magnetises better. And with the output windings you can see one is flipped here because we want the MOSFETs to take it in turn, turning on and off. We don't want them both coming on together or both going off together. So when this side goes positive, this side goes negative and vice versa. Next is this diode and resistor. And what this does is it makes sure that the gate can discharge nice and quickly, or at least as quick as this variable resistor will allow. And this 5 ohm resistor slows down how quickly the gate can charge. This way, if the MOSFETs are connected in a totem ball configuration like this, there's basically a small amount of dead time after one MOSFET turns off and the other MOSFET turns on, so there's no chance of shoot through, or in other words, a transition point where both MOSFETs are on, because if that was to happen, something would definitely go bang. And yes, there's a little bit of time when the MOSFETs are operating in their linear region, but it's such a small amount of time that it really doesn't matter, just make sure you've got a big enough heatsink. And finally, there's these back-to-back -back Zener diodes connected to the gate and source pins of each MOSFET, just to clamp down the gate voltage so it doesn't go high enough to do any damage. And this is basically the configuration you're going to see in just about every Tesla coil ever. Well, every one that uses more than one MOSFET. So as you can see here, we've got the transformer, the diodes and the resistors. And we have a nice waveform on the scope. 
And again, as I adjust the potentiometer, we can adjust this to get it exactly where we need. I don't actually think I'm supplying this with enough voltage for the diodes to do their thing, but um, you get the general idea. So, anyway, that's it for now, because I'm sure this video is already 4,000 million decades long, so, uh, yeah, I'm gonna go now, so, until next time, goodbye.